<coughs> thank you, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we have a very delightful uh, presentation uh, with uh, both um, Martin and uh, Chris. So that I, I see there is a commonality between your presentation. Is that well, both of you are working very hard to engage people. Uh, in the, into the design, uh, process of urban design. So before we start our uh, discussion, um, I know that, well, Francisco, you will have a brief uh, presentation, uh, a few slides to show. So uh, uh, time is yours. Uh. First of all, I want to thank HKIU for the invitation. And Macau is a small neighbor of Hong Kong, and we have many things in common, like some names like the Praia Avenue. Uh, just very fast to show this photo that you know, particularly the one after. This is the Macau Main Square. was a public space for taxis. And then this one that is the Cathedral Square was a, a car park, and then it was changed in the Chinese-Portuguese uh, culture square. And then this one is an article that came in a newspaper. It's a very famous square called the Apojang, or Lilao in Portuguese. And this span was done in 1996. And in fact, the one who promoted this design was the Cultural Institute that promote a minimalist approach to heritage. And they say what is authentic is the modern, not the tradition or the, the classic design. And then the local population opposed and say, because this looked like a fun mall, kind of a cemetery stone, and all the things were changed after a public consultation from a minimalist and square it to a tradition that follow the Portuguese cobblestones uh, and more organic architecture. So this is a flashback of the um, the projects and how we change a place where people were put aside to give way to the car and how to restore back the place to the people, but at the same time to imprint our cultural DNA so that this is Macau and not another city that could be New York or Sydney. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So may I invite Yang Xiang to uh, say a few words? Thank you, thank you, Vincent. Uh, great, to, great to be sitting in this brilliant panel, uh, looking at the uh, the speakers. Um, I, I guess Martin really you share great examples how uh, uh, places in uh, in Eastern Europe or Central Europe actually matters, uh, not only to that region but also to the rest of the world because we have more interconnected cities right now. I think the experience and know how they're shared. Uh, and Chris, I think you gave an, an, another intellectual paradigm that the local ingenuity. Uh, these inventions, in, in, the inventions of the local community really matters actually a lot to the vitality and what's, what's happening. And I, I think same uh, kind of intellectual model was shared by Francisco's intervention in Macau. Uh, very impressive quality of the, uh, the spaces, the interventions. Uh, I was asked by Vincent to talk about uh, the initiatives. How can we transform the, uh, moving from the ideas to reality? Uh, and looking around the room, I think, well, I'm, I'm probably the least qualified person uh, to speak on that project because while well, I'm full-time academics, um, I teach in the University of Hong Kong. Actually, I run the urban design master curriculums. Uh, so actually, we're known for those actually talk the talk but never walk the walk. Uh, but <clears throat> I guess thinking on the well, on second thoughts, I, I, I think there's two ways that even our academics actually can contribute uh, to the discipline, actually, to how to uh, make this into reality. At least in two ways. The first uh, we talk about is people. Uh, we need young people, talents, and that's actually uh, our role as educators uh, in terms of designing the curriculum, uh, mimicking sort of the real challenges, solving real urban issues. Uh, so we purposefully actually teach all the paradigms, the place-making theories were taught worldwide. Uh, typically, actually, it was generated in the Anglo-Saxon American city context or European city context, uh, it's accepted uh, worldwide. Uh, but we purposefully allow students to practice uh, with real urban issues, not necessarily convenient, 
in, in the context of where, where these uh, theories are generated. This year we're working in uh, New Zealand, in Auckland, the year before we were in Mumbai, in India, and a year ago, uh, even a year ago before that, it was the, uh, in, in uh, Gdansk in Poland, I think, very, uh, not far away from Prague, that Martin, you were practicing on. Um, so the purpose is to allow students to recognize they can take nothing for granted. It's the, uh, the granularity of the local lifestyle, um, the rigor um, of the urban design or place-making theories needs to be revamped to a, a new level that uh, we have to be really systematic in approaching uh, the way that the, the culture, the behaviors, the attitudes, um, and how people uh, use and appreciate the spaces. Um, the second contribution, I think we are also relevant, uh, is the know-how. I mean, I'm not using uh, knowledge or theory or science in any ways, but the know-how is related to the fundamental questions uh, of the high-density cities, which I think Hong Kong as an icon, uh, we should actually contribute more in the discipline of urban design and in, in the side of what we have already been known for or contributed because we have the uniqueness, the diversity of the built environment, the exposure to the physical aspect, the views, daylight, noise, ventilation, air quality. So the family's household live on the 30th floor versus the families live on the ground floor have the great diversity and the quality of life in their health outcomes, mental well-beings, behavior outcomes, and not many actually is known in literature because typically, we we'll say the, the Western literature or the other part of the world, they're either not dense yet, uh, or that actually they're not very sort of concerned with the, with the problems confronting us. So uh, from sort of the unknowns, actually in first our action as a researcher, so I'm putting my researcher hat on, uh, I'm actually co-directing one of these newly founded lab called Sustainable High Density Cities Lab, and where we actually work in truly interdisciplinary team. Uh, we don't even call ourselves or building physicists or kind of mechani mechanical engineers uh, or design designer landscape architects or kind of spatial epidemiologists because we truly believe as a discipline we need to constantly reinvent ourselves. We need to grow the body uh, of the, the discipline, the knowledge, the know-hows, uh, allow us to push forward. Uh, and that only in that fashion, I think we can constantly stay on top of these issues we're, we're addressing and, and stay relevant and actually really make uh, a rigorous and uh, sort of the, the, the reliable uh, actions. So really you're welcome to uh, check us out or actually join us as uh, the Sustainable High Density Cities Lab at the University of Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jian Xie. Um, now, the, you know, the, the title of this symposium, Betterment of the City, and the subject of this section is, uh, this session is Realizing Betterment Initiative. And after hearing uh, our speakers of this session's uh, pre presentation, I noticed that the four of you are all change makers. You know, you are doing something that people never did before. And it's only with this initiative that do, you are doing things to better uh, your city. Now, um, Rocco in the first session has mentioned about bringing dream to reality. And Rocco point out uh, they they're, ac they're actually uh, obstacles to overcome, right? So, and every changes will face obstacles. So I would like to hear from every one of you, you know, in realizing your initiative to better that city, whether it's uh, in Prague, uh, in Macau, uh, or in Hong Kong, and I know, Chris, you are trying to occupy the public space, <laughs> whether it's in Central, or in Wan Chai, right? Uh, so what are the obstacles that you need to overcome? And who would like to speak first? Maybe I'll, I'll say a few things. I, I, I think it's, uh, it, it's like this. It, it's, uh, 
it's, it's like the, the arts of the, of the muddling through. I, I think people underestimate the merits of, of uh, muddling through. I, I, I think doing this kind of thing is like, it's like, well, it, it's like you're, you're given a, an old battered uh, Nissan or Toyota truck or, or battered car or an old kind of uh, Land Rover. Now, you've got this old car, you don't know, kind of, it doesn't really go very far, it's not perfect, but then it's, it's kind of how do, you, how do you make use of it? <laughs> what, what do you do with it? Can you kind of change a bit of it uh, and then add a bit on top and then how do you drive it? So, so I, I, I think it's, it's really about um, uh, uh, recognizing that the best cities are actually not the perfect city. And the best cities are actually like this old battered car. Uh, and it's actually all about how you drive that old battered car and how do you kind of retune it a bit and then uh, add a bit of canvas on top so that you can live in it uh, or you can kind of drive it away. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually all, all about um, recognizing that, uh, that uh, real cities are always extremely complex and rich and are actually full of all kinds of obstacles. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and the way is, is actually recognized, the best cities are actually the ones that cannot make anything happen. I mean, London has never managed to make anything happen for the last 25 years. They couldn't even build a, a new kind of airport or a runway. Uh, but, and yet, kind of, it is actually very possible to, to recognize that those kind of cities are very often the best. OK, thank you. Let's hear what others say. So you don't want to change your car? <laughs> no, in fact, your car would keep evolving. <laughs> we keep evolving. I mean, your, your car, you would keep kind of retuning it, customizing it. I think if you want a planning framework, it's probably Patrick Geddes, isn't it? It's, it's, the, it's the, the kind of Patrick Geddes uh, way of looking at city in a kind of conservative surgery and looking at the possibilities of a city uh, rather than the constraint of a city. Uh, because if you start with constraint, you can, you can go nowhere. So what you need to do is to look at possibility first. OK, see. OK, Martin, what would you say? Well, Prague is a very old car. <laughs> and and it's, it's, I come from a place that, uh, in New York, which is uh, inherently always trying to be new, particularly for the last 15 or 20 years. Um, so when I first came there, there was a huge learning curve for me to try to understand how to, how to make the, the old car new again in Prague. And we have a very particular a uh, problem in Prague that we're trying to deal with from the nonprofit sector, which is education. Um, we were recently awarded a, a large grant from the Vodafone Foundation to, to create this platform that I talked about to involve citizens in, in building real projects. And the jury, which is very educated on urban issues and technology issues, asked if by the end of the year we could launch the website, launch the platform, have the competition for the, the space, the public space, get a private sector sponsor, and build it all in one year. And we were talking about park scale projects. So this is hectares of, of land, perhaps. Um, so there was a very sort of low level of education about how long an, an urban development project takes, particularly a public space project, and the comp complexity in doing that. So I've had to sort of temper my expectations of, of, of impact, um, because we're really starting at the grassroots level. And it was surprising to Rocco, who, who said, I thought Prague had a tradition of urban, urban design and urbanism. And there is a tradition um, in, in the faculties, but uh, really for the last 50 or 60 years through communism and into the free, free market economy, um, the faculties of architecture have, have not focused on the sustainable urbanism that we talk about in this room, the great words that have been circulating so far. Uh, the faculty of, of architecture has an urbanism degree, which at the end of the, that degree, the students have to present a floor plan of a building. So it's a very kind of building-centric based urbanism, which doesn't pay attention to the public realm. So we're starting at a very sort of grassroots level, trying at a very low level, trying to educate uh, politicians and, and investors why this issue is important. That being said, there, there are huge changes. Like I said, in the last four years, there's been an institute founded, run by the city, uh, that is proposing a new metropolitan plan, uh, new strategic plan, 
urban design initiatives. They've already started renovating two spaces. Uh, so this kind of soft impact is starting to translate into hard impact. The difficult part, I think, from our sector, from the nonprofit sort of cultural sector, is to convince people that the soft impact is important. Um, people in, our, in my own board said after three years, you know, what impact has Resite had? You know, where's the where's the park? Where's the public space? And our response was very. First, we were very timid and said, "You're right. You know, we haven't really <laughs> we haven't really impacted anything." But that's in that environment. It's sort of like asking what the importance of a book is, right? I mean, we have to start. We have to start understanding the literature first and reading the literature, and then the impact comes, and that's starting to come. Um, so in the last few months, there's we, we've we've struggled with uh, adapting a new metropolitan plan, uh, adapting new building regulations, which have been held up in political processes. So planning has been used as a political football. Um, so we're we're really getting out a lot in the media and trying to un make people understand that the old car needs to be refreshed and it needs to have new sustainable planning priorities in the city. Uh, to do so, and new development can coexist with old development. I mean, Hong Kong is a, is a perfect example. Okay, thank you. And Francisco? Thank you. I have a, a question, or at the same time, um, well, for both, but first for Christopher, because you mentioned about um, the, um, the diary you are doing and is a kind of a cultural mapping of the city or the fabric of Hong Kong, at least certain areas. And then the org you jump to organizing uh, activities, so, and that show the genius of uh, Hong Kong people. So the next step, I think, how can you link this with the genius of Hong Kong people in the planning to planning activities? So to start really not just using a place, but to jump. And then, when I saw the presentation of Martin, I was thinking, because um, I very much think the landscape is very necessary for ecological reasons, but um, it's something that we are struggling in Macau with many cities, is how to link heritage and ecological. So we remove the cars, the air become better. So these are to all profit from this next step, let's say. Great, yes. Okay, well, I will welcome a uh, question from the floor, if you have any. Yes, I can see Mi Cam. Yes, Mi Cam. Uh, thank you for uh, two very inspiring uh, talks. Uh, this instant or tactical urbanism, they are truly amazing. Uh, my question probably uh, is like an anti climax I, I, I want to ask a very practical question, especially to Chris. I remember uh, a social worker also tried to occupy a park and do some kind of like, you know, this kind of tactical or instant urbanism. And uh, he attracted criticisms from the local residents as well as the policemen, because obviously he, uh, you know, they didn't get the consent. So you are organizing such uh, big events. So I wonder how you got the consent and make sure the policeman is not bothering you. And also, uh, how do you deal with like issues like insurance or management issues? Yes. Yeah. In fact, uh, what we do, uh, in fact, it's quite straightforward. Everyone can do it. Actually, I want more and more people doing the same thing. Well, we usually um, uh, put together uh, the plan and then put it on Facebook and then get people to come and join. And then we go and uh, uh, explain it to the, the district board. And then we talk to the district board members and get the district board's uh, um, uh, approval uh, on what we want to do. And then the government would actually give us the space. Um, and we get the lands department's uh, approval on it. Uh, we also get the um, buildings department's approval on it. So the fire services people come. We coordinate with about 16 different departments. We also buy third-party insurance for all the activities. So it's actually quite, quite straightforward, isn't it? Okay, straightforward. Sounds very easy, right? Uh, how long does it take? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> usually, <laughs> Maggie would know. <laughs> well, usually about two to three months. Uh, but, um, but it's actually much better if the land is... Uh, managed by the LCSD, then you can shortcut a lot of these. But, but if the land is, uh, is uh, uh, not lodged at the lands department, 
then you have to get all the approval from bottom up. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other question from the floor? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Chris, you're attracting all the attention. <laughs> this also for you. Uh, firstly, I congratulate you for fantastic uh, work in this area. I want to ask this question because I keep looking at the pictures and look at the people, and I can't help but feel that there's certain similarities. Now, from a demographic point of view, do you find that there are always the same grouping of people who come to your event? What happened to the rest of the people? I mean, this is a relevant question because ground up initiative is great, but we find that we always end up attracting the same people. Second question related to that, are you able to influence your government to rethink about the old car? Yes, like, like our conference, we are having the same people. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well <laughs> I think that's one characteristic of, uh, of Hong Kong. Um, but we find that uh, it depends on the location. I, I think um, uh, those people who go to the East Kowloon uh, are actually very different from the people who turn up at, uh, at the Blue House. I think Blue House is actually very grassroots uh, and extremely, um, uh, in fact, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, people in the, the working class uh, uh, joining the, 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 um, the, the Blue House community, uh, whereas Star Street is definitely very middle class. Uh, so um, I, I, I think what we want to do is actually uh, to fill the uh, the qualitative void uh, of the present planning process, and then and then seeing narrative uh, actually on its own as a planning process, rather than narrative as a way to collect quantifiable data. I mean, if if you go down the the kind of abstraction quantifiable data route, uh, then don't even bother using narrative um, because that that that's a dead end road. But what narrative can do is actually to fill the void that quantitative abstraction way of planning cannot reach. Um, so, so, uh, so in, in that sense, we, we are we're exploring the uh, kind of narrative on its own as planning. Thank you. Other questions? You want to ask questions with one another? can add to this. I, I think in, in New York, underneath Mayor Bloomberg, these, uh, these ground-up initiatives were, were quite celebrated. And in fact, many of the commissioners were given license to try to do temporary interventions. And particularly Jeanette Sadakan, the commissioner of transportation, uh, did a lot of pop-up parks, uh, particularly the biggest one being in Times Square. Um, if anyone's been to Times Square you know, 15 years ago versus today, the transformation is remarkable. It's still not great, but it's, 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 it's more pedestrian friendly. Uh, traffic has gotten better, and it's now a public space. It, it, New York never had a public square, sort of Zocalo. Now it does. It's, it's, it's there, and it's pedestrian. Um, and the idea of the temporary, it's called uh, 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 parking to plazas program, is, is that uh, uh, streets to plazas, it's that this temporary intervention, these temporary actions can change, not, not necessarily change the space, but change the perception of the space. And therefore, it mu becomes much easier to, to propose doing a pedestrian square. And if the perception doesn't change and business owners don't like the, the results, uh, then it doesn't need to become a square. It can always be turned back into streetscape because the intervention has been temporary. And I, I, would, I, I found this curious about the, the data, quantitative data, because in, in our case in New York and also the things we're doing in Prague, we really need, needed the data to convince business owners uh, that these changes were necessary and that they actually could improve uh, business and real estate values. In Times Square in particular, in the first year, all the data was studied from retail owners, uh, from shop owners and, and, um, and building owners who did not want p p the spaces to be pedestrianized. By, by and large, there was a massive media campaign against these changes. Uh, but the data collected showed that retail revenues increased something like 110% in the first year. Real estate values and rental uh, uh, rates raised 200%. And that's a hard argument to, to fight because um, when you're looking at it, in economic terms, design, public space is incredibly valuable. Well, uh, I think it's worth exploring, but, yeah. uh, but two of the people who actually changed American pop culture, pop architecture, 
uh, in the post-war post uh, world period more than anyone else. Uh, one is actually uh, uh, Hefner, yeah? the Playboy magazine. I think between the Playboy magazine uh, and the maybe, maybe an architect like kind of Victor Gruen, they actually changed kind of the face of post-war pop, pop architecture in America more than Mies van der Rohe or anyone else. And, and the Playboy magazine actually did it through narrative. Yes, uh, Xiang Xiang. If I can just uh, shortly add to the, the car argument and also the quantitative analysis, um, I think our stance is that as a discipline, uh, we should embrace um, the data, embrace new technologies out there. But I think the different, the fine line is between whether the, the content are generated by the people, um, the users, and whether ownership of this data it should also be the people, actually, who matters on a day-in, day-out basis. So I guess a lot of these uh, studies and statistics that Martin mentioned is probably from the social media, and that actually people with the mobile apps will tell you whether they're happy or not, they're doing what, they're concerned about what, and we, we have those tools. And these, I think these are really powerful tools that can transform um, the techniques that we, we, we kind of think about, even sort of they, they, they do anything about our built environment. So uh, back to these, the argument of the car is whether we still stick with the old car or the uh, new car. And these type of technologies enable us to think deeply of what kind of tool we need. Maybe it's a Google car, maybe it's a hybrid, maybe it's just a bicycle, is what I can, my, my wife told me as she's uh, not driving around in, in, in Hong Kong, but maybe a bike is probably a better um, alternative. So I think with, with that, uh, uh, with that said, I think it's actually, it should be a, a supplement uh, to, the, to the interventions. It's great examples that we lead, and I think we're constantly learning uh, from this kind of muddling through process. It's both theory and practice. Okay, thank you. Uh, Francesco, you have, uh, I, you have one minute. They showed me that time is up, so, so yes. let's wrap up. No, less than one minute. Uh, the city is an amazing lab, and that's why I think these initiatives are important, so we can ch change and share experience about the lab in Prague, Hong Kong, or other cities. And also it's important to share the network of schools and institutes, so the data and experience, because all of this uh, can help to feed our students and help them to brainstorm and come out. And maybe the future leaders will be more sensitive that the public space should be designed bottom up and not the reverse. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, wow, so lesson learned for this session. Uh, each city have a, we, we have our own car, which is nice, whether, uh, whether it's old or new or old, no, so, so uh, look for the merit uh, of our own car. So working with people, get connected with people, uh, whether it's meeting or social media, Facebook or whatever, use new technology. Um, uh, for big plan, we definitely have a lot of obstacles because they are always reluctant to change. So, so the lesson learned here, we, we start with small things, right? Uh, and, and people will get, get connected, educated, so, and, and then think things can build up on, on that uh, level. My experience with this 73 kilometer Victoria Harbour front in Hong Kong is that, well, None of these big plans for Victor the entire Victoria Harbour actually work because people just talk and talk and talk about it before it's executed. When you start executing it, people will talk again. <laughs> so, so the lesson that we've learned is to just composing, like composing bits and pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. When you see two things, when, when you see anything that you can do, just do it right there. And, and things will evolve. And this is the lesson that we learn from connecting the, the bits and pieces of the Victoria Harbor. So thank you very much for your sharing. Uh, I suppose it's lunchtime, right? Okay, thank you very much.